Greetings to the children of God all over the planet. When Jesus walked the earth, he preached and taught the gospel of the kingdom. Yet if you ask any five Christians today what the gospel of the kingdom is, you will probably get five different responses. I wrote this book to explain the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached and taught long ago. He said in Matthew 24 and 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all nations, and then the end shall come. These five videos explain five chapters of this book, which is not for sale. It can be downloaded for free at drdebrabooks.com, D-R-D-E-B-R-A-B-O-O-K-S.com, or you may listen to me read chapter three, which is titled, The Keys of the Kingdom. Amen. Now, there are two videos that precede this one and two that come after. So I'm going to begin with question 26. How can a person enter the kingdom? Keys are required for a person to enter the kingdom. Question 27. What is a key? A key serves to reveal, discover, or solve something. Question 28. Why are keys required to enter the kingdom? Jesus said that the kingdom has keys when he spoke to the apostle Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter then had the keys of the kingdom. The word keys is plural. Therefore, more than one key is necessary for entrance into the kingdom. Question 29. When did Peter use the keys of the kingdom? Peter used the keys of the kingdom to let people enter the kingdom in the second chapter of Acts. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 37 and 38. Question 30. What are the keys of the kingdom? The keys of the kingdom are the directions mentioned in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many, question 31, how many keys of the kingdom exist? Three keys of the kingdom exist. The keys are, one, repent. Two, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Three, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The first key is repentance or a person's turning away from sins he has committed in the past. The second key is water baptism of a person in the name of Jesus. This is also known as being born of water because a person is born or led up out of the water after he is baptized. The third key is a person's receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is always manifested by the person speaking in tongues 
or divine languages after he has received the invisible gift which he can sense in his belly or navel area. This is also known as being born of the Spirit because after a person has received the gift of the Holy Ghost, he is or should be born or led by the Spirit of God. Obedience to the second and third keys is what Jesus meant by the term born again. Question 32. What does born again mean? Being born again means that a person has obeyed the keys of the kingdom. Only a person who has repented will be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Obedience is the second key. I'm sorry. Obedience to the second key constitutes being born of water. Obedience to the third key constitutes being born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked Jesus two questions about being born again in the third chapter of John. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. That's John 3, verses 4 through 8. Question 33. Can a person become born again by accepting Christ as his personal Savior? There are no scriptures in the Holy Bible that indicate Jesus has to be accepted as a personal Savior or as anything else by anyone. Jesus did not even use the word except in the Bible. According to the third chapter of John, being born again requires action involving water and spirit, not acceptance. Question 34. Is there any other way for a person to enter the kingdom without obeying the three keys of the kingdom, or Acts 2.38? If a person does not obey the three keys of the kingdom, or Acts 2.38, that person will not be able to enter the kingdom during his lifetime. This is why Jesus says, ye must be born again in John 3 and 7. Obeying the keys of Acts 2.38 is the only way for a living person to enter the kingdom. The Apostle Peter was the only apostle who received the keys of the kingdom. Only by obeying Peter's directions in Acts 2.38 can a living person enter the kingdom. Question 35. Does God expect people to understand the gospel of the kingdom before they obey the keys of the kingdom or Acts 2.38? No, Jesus does not expect people to understand the gospel of the kingdom before they obey the keys of the kingdom, or Acts 2.38. According to the scriptures, it is impossible for a person to comprehend the gospel of the kingdom until after he has obeyed the keys of the kingdom. In the same discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 and 3. Only a person who has been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in divine tongues is able to understand or perceive the gospel of the kingdom. 
the gospel of the kingdom is incomprehensible to anyone who has not obeyed Acts 2.38. This is why Jesus said in Luke 18 and 17, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter therein. Little children obey directions without being able to understand the purpose behind the directions. People who enter the kingdom do so because they obey Acts 2.38 without being able to understand the gospel of the kingdom. They obey Acts 2.38 because they love God and want to demonstrate their love by their obedience to Peter's direction to enter the kingdom just as a little child obeys adults. Question 36. Does Jesus expect people to understand the gospel of the kingdom after they have entered the kingdom by obeying Acts 2.38? Yes, Jesus does expect people to understand the gospel of the kingdom after they have entered the kingdom. But they will have to be taught by someone who understands the gospel of the kingdom. Knowledge of the gospel of the kingdom is not instantaneous after a person has obeyed the keys of the kingdom. Jesus discussed this issue with the disciples. In Matthew thirteen fifty two, Then he said unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things old and new. I'm sorry, things new and old. A scribe is a writer. A person who is able to teach and explain the gospel of the kingdom using the scriptures will be like the head of a family because he has a complete understanding of the meaning of the New and Old Testaments as the head of a family has the knowledge of everything that occurs in the home and is able to bring out the precepts of God in both testaments to others. This is the type of person who is able to teach the gospel of the kingdom. Question 37. How important is the first key of repentance? A person cannot enter the kingdom unless he repents. It is impossible for a person to access God without repentance. If a person believes that he and all of his actions are inherently correct, he can never enter the kingdom. Jesus discussed the issue of self-righteousness, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Although the Pharisee was a doctrinally strict Jew, and the publican was an odious collector of public taxes, the publican was viewed more positively by Jesus because he acknowledged his sinful state, his spiritual deficiency. In order to enter the kingdom, a person must repent of his sins. 
This can be done privately or publicly according to the style of the assembly. In some churches, the altar workers will ask people, have you repented or are you sorry for sins you have committed in the past? A yes answer and no further personal history or details to either question is a sufficient response and qualifies as completion of the first key of the kingdom. In some churches, a person who asks to be baptized in water is assumed to have already repented of his sins. A person's walking down an aisle during an altar call or a person's calling the church to request water baptism can also serve as indicators that a person has already repented and has completed the first key of the kingdom. Question 38, how important is the second key of water baptism in the name of Jesus. A person cannot enter the kingdom unless he is baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave directions to the apostles in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. The apostles obeyed this commandment by baptizing people in water in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The first instance of people's being baptized in water in Jesus' name occurs in Acts 2, 38 through 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls. The Apostle Philip also baptized people in the name of Jesus Christ. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's Acts 8 and 12. Philip baptized a black man who was a politically powerful eunuch in Acts 36 through 38. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The apostle Peter told Gentile believers to get baptized in Jesus' name in Acts 10, 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Tarry means wait. The apostle Paul instructed a repentant warden in Acts 16, 29 through 33. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. 
When the Apostle Paul discovered men who had been baptized by John the Baptist, he upgraded their baptism. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. If people have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they should get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as the people in the above scripture did. About 100 years after the death of the last surviving apostle, a dispute arose because some people who did not carefully read their Bibles felt that people should be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, instead of in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the way the apostles baptized people. The people who did not carefully read their Bibles prevailed, and at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, a pope named Constantine decided that people would be baptized according in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Today, Constantine's baptism is still used in the Catholic Church, in all Protestant churches, and in many churches and assemblies that do not have Protestant origins. Churches that are listed in the yellow pages or on the internet as apostolic or apostolic faith generally baptize according to Acts 2.38. If a person wants to be baptized, it is wise to call an apostolic church and ask, do you baptize according to Acts 2.38? If the response is yes, make arrangements to get baptized there in Jesus' name as soon as possible. If the response to the question is no, or we baptize according to Acts 2.38 and or Matthew 28.19, Keep calling churches until the correct response is heard. A person must be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ in order to enter the kingdom. If a person refuses to be baptized in the name of Jesus, he shall be unable to enter the kingdom and shall be eternally separated from Jesus. In Matthew 7, 22, note how the phrase, in thy name, is repeated. The people are trying to justify that even though they refused to get baptized in Jesus' name, they did other actions in Jesus' name. Pay close attention to the response of the Lord. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's Matthew seven twenty one through 23. These scriptures very clearly demonstrate that a person must be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ in order to enter the kingdom. Performance of any other activities in the name of Jesus does not cancel or affect this requirement. Question 39. How important is the third key of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with tongues? A person cannot enter the kingdom unless he has received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Since the Holy Ghost is the invisible Spirit of God, the only way a person knows he has received the Holy Ghost is that he will begin to speak a divine language. 
that he has not spoken before immediately after receiving the Holy Ghost. When the apostles and the others that were with them received the gift of the Holy Ghost, they began to speak divine languages. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's Acts 2 and 4. The apostle Peter was surprised to see that Gentiles received the Holy Ghost. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's Acts 10, 45 and 46. After the Apostle Paul had upgraded the baptisms of the men who had been baptized by John, they received the Holy Ghost. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. That's Acts 19 and 6. Jesus was referring to a person's receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost when he cried in John 7, 37 and 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. As a person is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, he will experience a sensation in his belly or navel area. The evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost is not sensations, but the person will hear himself speaking a divinely inspired language. People who do not carefully read their Bibles believe that they can receive the Holy Ghost without speaking in other tongues. The Apostle Paul wrote, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's Romans 8 and 9. Without a person speaking in tongues, there is no evidence he has received the Holy Ghost. A person cannot enter the kingdom without having received the gift of the Holy Ghost as manifested by a person speaking divinely inspired languages. There are many people today who believe that speaking in tongues is of God, but some believe this is an optional gift and not a requirement. That belief is wrong and cannot be supported by the scriptures. After a discussion of the appropriate times during worship service for speaking in tongues, the Apostle Paul concludes the discussion in 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Wherefore, brethren covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. There are no scriptures which support the view that speaking in tongues was a requirement only for a certain group of people or for a certain period of time in history. Generally, a church or assembly that practices baptism according to Acts 2.38 shall also believe in receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, also according to Acts 2.38. If a person wants to receive the Holy Ghost, he should call an apostolic church that baptizes according to Acts 2.38 and ask to meet with an altar worker or minister. A person can receive the Holy Ghost at any time and in any place, but praising the Lord with the encouragement of others helps some people to focus better. No human being can give anyone the Holy Ghost. If someone claims to have that ability, leave that person immediately and do not return. When a person hears himself speaking a divine language, this means the person has received the Holy Ghost and has completed the third key of the kingdom. Question 40. How important is entering the kingdom? 
Jesus said that people who refuse to do his will would be eternally separated from him, no matter what spiritual accomplishments they had attained. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. If a person believes that Jesus is Lord, that belief will not enable a person to enter the kingdom. If a person accepts Christ as his personal Savior, that acceptance will not enable a person to enter the kingdom. Only a person's obedience to Acts 2.38 will enable a living person to enter the kingdom. Question 41. Are Christians the only people in the kingdom? Jesus said the Old Testament patriarchs were in the kingdom and not only New Testament Christians. He said, and I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 8, 11. Question 42. Do the keys have to be obeyed in a particular order? A person does not have to obey the keys in a particular order. Some people receive the Holy Ghost first, then they are baptized in Jesus' name. The Apostle Peter watched Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost as he preached to them. Then he told them to get baptized. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. That's Acts 10, 44 through 48. Repentance can be regarded as the invisible key. A person can repent at any time, yet his repentance may not be visible to others. Occasionally, a person does get baptized in Jesus' name without fully repenting. When this occurs, the person does not receive the Holy Ghost until he has totally repented for his sins. When people have been baptized, yet days and months have passed without their receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, that delay is due to the lack of the first key, which is repentance. A repentant person can instantly receive the Holy Ghost, no matter what order the keys are obeyed, whenever they are followed, a person enters the kingdom. Question 43. What is the difference between entering the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom? To enter the kingdom means to go into the kingdom. A person enters the kingdom by obeying the three keys of the kingdom, which are identified by the apostle Peter in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, number one, repent and Number two, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And number three, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In order to enter the kingdom on this earth, a person has to be alive and breathing air. Any living person who obeys the keys enters the kingdom. To inherit the kingdom means to come into possession of the kingdom as a successor. Only those people who are deemed as righteous by Jesus after they have died shall permanently inherit the kingdom. Jesus distinguishes between people who have obeyed his word and people who have been disobedient to his word. 
Matthew 25, 31 through 36 reads, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. The difference between entering the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom is that any of the living who obey Acts 2.38 can enter the kingdom, but only the righteous dead inherit the kingdom. Jesus illustrated the difference in this parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathereth of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew thirteen forty-seven through 50. Question 44. How is the term enter into the kingdom mentioned in the scriptures? For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not e That's Matthew 5 and 20. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's Matthew seven twenty one. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be oops, can I skip a page? Uh, let's see. Nope. Sorry. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew eighteen and three. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. That's Matthew 18 and 8. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. That's Mark 9:47. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's John 3 and 5. We must, the end of, uh, well, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's the end of Acts 14 and 22. Question 45. How is the term inherit the kingdom mentioned in the scriptures? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. I have to stop for a minute. Now, when it says not not effeminate, that's referring to homosexuals. But as you can see, 
this scripture also includes fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, and abusers of themselves with mankind. That's people who have sex with objects. Can all of these people who do these things repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, be filled with the Holy Ghost, and be saved? Yes, everyone who obeys Acts 2.38 can be saved. I know there is a false teaching that Roman 1 is being misapplied to homosexuals, but that is a misapplication of chapter 1 in Romans. That is not to be applied to someone who is a homosexual because God loves homosexuals and everybody. Romans 1 applies to church people only, a specific type of church person known as a reprobate saint. There are three types of reprobate saints. There's homosexual reprobates. There's heterosexual reprobates. And there are asexual reprobates. And if you want more information on the reprobate saint, please download my book titled Time Out for the Reprobate Saint, which is also on my website, drdebrabooks.com. D-R-D-E-B-R-A-B-O-O-K-S dot com. Amen nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. And those two scriptures apply to practically 100% of the planet. Okay? So if you have done these things, please know you can still be saved. Just get baptized in Jesus' name, fill the Holy Ghost, uh, and also repent according to Acts 2.38. God died for everybody. God does not hate anybody. And please do not listen to Christians who tell you that because they are very misinformed. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and 50. Now the works of the flesh are, the, are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God that's Galatians 5 19 through 21 but if you want to be saved and you are have engaged in any of these activities know this there is hope for you God loves you that's why he died on the cross to save you. So if you have been engaging in any of these activities and you want to have a relationship with God, just call an apostolic faith church, get baptized in Jesus' name, get filled with the Holy Ghost after you repent or when you repent. Amen. In Jesus' name, there's hope for everybody. God loves you. Amen. Thank you for listening.